come and gone on Spartan Media Reviews, and what better show to talk about than Madoka Magica? An awesome example of a series that can be looked at from multiple angles. Before creating this video, I wanted to rewatch Madoka Magica. Not because I found it to be a great series the first time I saw it, but because of one drastic difference that comes with watching the series after the first time. The loss of unexpected moments. A big reason as to why I believe people get hooked on this show falls to the different take on the Magical Girl style and the unexpected moments that accompany it. While yes, those things are great for the series and they certainly hit hard the first time I saw the show back in 2014, does the rest of the series hold up? Are there other elements that make Madoka great? 100% yes, and I believe those are the ideas you should be talking about as well. <laughs> The first scene of Madoka Magica is just as powerful and iconic as scenes in episode 1's like Neon Genesis Evangelion, Code Geass, and Technolize to name a few. Madoka's bright character design clashing with the black and white color palette conveys not only the apocalyptic world that is now here, but the pure nature and hope that Madoka still has before she becomes a magical girl. It also helps that the first scene contains that great ending track from Kalafina, along with solid production from Studio Shaft. I also think one of the beauties of this show is the amount of ways you can look at the importance of the premise. There are so many separate storylines blended into this one narrative that allows you, the viewer, to interpret which one you think is the most important. Is the story about Madoka's decision? Is it about Homura trying and failing at stopping Madoka from becoming a magical girl? Or is it even about Kyuubi and the ideas of the human race? That's the beauty of this story. All these concepts are great and they could all be separate entities on their own, yet they all receive the same amount of importance. For all these ideas to blend into 12 episodes seamlessly is a great accomplishment, and with all of these ideas, the series is able to bring about multiple themes that you can interpret in any way you want. Much like Evangelion, the biggest theme I took away from Madoka's narrative is its take on religion. You obviously do not have to agree with me on this, as it can be interpreted in any direction you want it to, but aside from the subtle scene additions like the God and Adam painting in the bar scene during episode 11, and the pure color palette of the main characters themselves, the big ideas I found were that of Kyoko's apples and Kyubei himself. Much like Death Note, the apples in Madoka Magica can be interpreted as the forbidden fruit from the Tree of Knowledge, and with that knowledge comes hatred and unhappiness, which is the entire backstory of Kyoko's transformation into a magical girl. There's an excellent article I found that discusses more on this topic, so check it out if you're interested. Link in the description. Kyubei and the ideas behind him also play to the themes of the temptation of sin. You can think of the witches as demons or even the damned, and the non-magical girls as the pure and innocent, the believers. The wish that Kyubei gives out may seem like it's too good to be true, because it is. Kyubei is the quote-unquote metaphorical devil and he lies to the believers with sinful ideals, while the soul gem is a metaphor for selling your soul to the devil in damnation. The girls try to hold out as long as possible, but eventually sin gives way. Also, Kyubei tries to make Homura out to be like an evil person, very similar to the ideas of evil people making the pure out to be evil, i.e. the devil's temptation and manipulation. After all of these positives, we can now discuss the elephant in the room, aka the reason why a lot of people love Monica Magica early on. <laughs> Episode 3 is great no matter how many times I've seen it. The change in tone is so beautifully done thanks to the change in music, new ending theme from Kalavina, and just the way the shots were framed in general. Seeing Mommy's final moments from inside of the witch's mouth just makes things that much worse for her as a character, but that much better for the viewer. This was the true start to Madoka Magica, and one that will stay iconic for a long time. To add to Episode 3's solid production, the disguising of the true premise is beautifully crafted, even when you know what's about to happen. From nailing the initial ideas of the magical girl, as well as making the soul gem seem like this wonderful power source instead of its literal interpretation, to the fact that the first ending is super lighthearted and cheerful. The first two episodes hit every checkmark on how to twist the perspective of an audience without causing harm to its narrative. To top it all off, the show concludes in a fantastic manner, as Madoka makes everyone's wishes come true, but in the pure sense like they were supposed to be. It makes what the characters fought for seem worthwhile in the end, and while Homura dislikes the outcome due to Madoka no longer existing, she will still fight to keep Madoka's wish a reality. It's tragic in the sense of someone having to die, but incredible in that Madoka would give up everything she had to save everyone else instead. <laughs> Okay. 
As with his multiple storylines, I don't believe that there is a magical girl that is more important than the other. Each girl, while going about it in a different way, all suffer from the same problem, with that being believing in something that was never there to begin with, otherwise known as being naive to the world around them. Every magical girl has a tragic life. It's not even part of the subversion of the genre, rather it just takes a more grim approach to everything. The death of the magical girl is bad enough, but what's worse is that there is a possibility that your body will never be found, and if you have no close friends or family, no one will miss you. This only becomes apparent when Mommy is killed, as she finally had people that cared about her to then being eaten now much later. That idea hits home for this story, and it does a good job in making it seem as realistic as possible, something that death battle shows even fail to do. In Sayaka's case, it's just as bad. She had friends and she used her wish to help them, however it only ends up hurting her as she becomes more reckless and cruel. Things start to backfire as her soul is literally misplaced and darkened because of these careless mistakes. For Homura, she is doing these things for all the right reasons, but the way she goes about them is a fatal error on her part, but something she really cannot control in the end. Homura never had that normal mindset about her, as we see she was overly shy in the beginning to finally becoming overly abrasive by the end. The middle ground would help her get her points across, and it could possibly have changed the fate of having to do things over and over again. But from the opposite perspective, Homura is still a human, and having to reset time over and over again because of tragic things like death will take an enormous toll on you, a la Okabe Rintaro. Madoka isn't without her own faults either. Even though she doesn't form a contract until the very end, Madoka still makes the mistake of coming back again and again. It only ends up hurting her. I mean, she causes her friend to lose her soul at one point in time. The decline of these characters after the death of Mami is great because it slowly happens instead of a quick moment. You are able to see a psychological breakdown in characters like Sayaka, the suffering in Madoka, the mental strain in Homura, and so on. The ideas behind the destruction of everything also plays well not only into the innocence and good intentions behind the characters, but to the innocence of the genre as well. That's why Homura is a solid anti-hero, if you will, for the story. She is the good compared to the evil of others, even if it is played the other way around. Her backstory is great and is definitely the best out of the bunch. I would watch a series just based around her alone, but for the one episode that we do receive, it's great and is certainly the best character driven episode of the series. Finally, there is the awful, cuddly creature itself, Kyubei. Kyubei is a great villain, mostly because what he is doing is correct in one way. Once again, it's that parasite or shiki mentality where they believe they are making rational decisions that are logically sound. However, they don't account for empathy and other human emotions. But how can they if they don't have emotions to begin with? What would have made things worse in this scenario but better for Kyubei's character would be that if a magical girl dies, their wish backfires. Or he could just be even more cruel and turn back the wish at any moment. It would make things way more tragic, but it would still keep Kyubei's logic rational. It's not needed considering he is already a great villain but I think it would make things that much better. Moving on to the technical side of things, everything is incredible. I really have no other words to describe how great this show looks and sounds. Animation-wise, everything is so aesthetically pleasing that it sucks you in almost immediately. The framing follows a solid rule of thirds. The lighting of shots are fantastic, along with the use of shadows. The artistic backdrops are very Shaft and post monogatari esque and the cinematic color scheme just brings everything together. While Studio Shaft and the animation staff that help bring this together do a fantastic job, I want to bring special attention to the witch labyrinths and battles. The witch battles and the labyrinths they are housed in have some of the best production quality that I have seen in any anime series. While they may not be the best of all time in sheer quality, and that's certainly debatable, everything that is blended together in these sequences creates an experience that cannot be duplicated. The backgrounds are beautiful and diverse, using multiple art styles and even different animation techniques like stop motion animation to bring these creative yet nightmarish worlds to life. The best thing about this is that both the designs of the witches and the labyrinths were created by two people. Let me say that again. Two people under the trope Gekadin Inukuri. Special mention also needs to be given to the battle in episode 7 and the final battle between Homura and Belpergisnot. Episode 7's Witch Battle is awesome. Even though it contains just a simple black and white color palette, it works so well to accentuate the details of everything else. The blood becomes all the more brutal, the mouth and eye movements become all the more engaging, and the beautiful animation quality shines through. While Homura's battle against Valpurgisnod is the icing on the cake to an already fantastic production. Starting with the countdown mixed in with the awesome choir to all the amazing moments in the fight itself. Epic doesn't give it enough praise. However, there is a two minute stretch of nothing but intense action that if I research correctly can be attributed to these two people right here, and the eye candy is incredible. Once again, two people. Just watch the show for its technical quality alone. 
please. Moving on, the opening and second ending are great conflicting pieces of animation, where the opening captures what the magical girl style is known for, making Madoka look like any other normal teenage girl, full of fun moments and bright colors. While the second ED is the true foreshadowing and thematical piece of the series, as we see examples of Homura reaching out to Madoka to stop her from following Kyubei, but she fails, as well as the chaos that ensues with Madoka's decision making, to then Madoka becoming a fetus, which interprets to Madoka wishing to start the world anew when she becomes a magical girl. Or I could be totally wrong, but that's my interpretation at least. Both the sub and dub are equally incredible, and picking between them in terms of which I liked more will certainly be a challenge, as they are great for entirely different things. The Japanese dub was genuine in that the voice actresses knew nothing about how their characters would progress, which gave their roles even more emotion and natural personality, while the English dub was able to prepare for these scenes, giving them ample opportunity to nail the mood of the show, and they certainly accomplished that. It's a case of pick your poison, but in the best way possible. Magica is a series that is an incredible watch going in blind, but an even better watch the second time around. Even though people bring up deconstruction left and right when discussing the show, more than anything, Madoka Magica is a cinematic masterpiece with incredible amounts of depth to its narrative and cast, all wrapped up into a beautiful animated production with an equally incredible soundtrack to boot. It certainly is one of the best examples of creating an original work in the anime medium, so if you haven't taken the plunge yet, please do yourself a favor and dive in. If you are interested in watching Madoka Magica, you can check out both the sub and dubbed releases over on Crunchyroll. Now, what are your thoughts on Madoka Magica? Comment below. If you enjoyed this video, hit that like button, I would really appreciate it. Subscribe for more anime related content and follow me on Twitter, Kitsu, and my anime list if you're interested. I'm Kent from Spartan Media Reviews, and I will catch you guys in my next video. Thank you for watching, and here's to another year.